Okay, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, how many people do we have? Oh, 18. That's a pretty good turnout. All right. So uh, I'd like to start, I suppose, by introducing myself. My name is Christopher White. I am um, an official iGUIDE guru, <laughs> and um, I was an iGUIDE photographer uh, many years ago before I became a marketing manager for iGUIDE. Um, and so I have a lot of technical knowledge buried in my head, uh, and I'm going to share some of that with you today. Uh, I'm going to talk for maybe 30 to 45 minutes. Because this is about Stitch, there's going to be a lot of on-screen sort of demonstration-y type stuff. Uh, but if you want, you can ask any questions you like in the chat, and then I'll, I'll go through them all at the end, and I'll answer them. Um, and uh, if we have extra time, they don't necessarily have to be Stitch-related. That will be the focus of this particular webinar. But um, if you have other questions, I don't mind. It's fine by me if we can answer those as well. Uh, so what we're going to do uh, first is talk about what Stitch is, where to find it, uh, and how to get help if you need it. So even if you don't listen to a thing I say today, I'm recording this webinar, so um, I can share it with anyone who wants it afterward. Um, if it's good enough, you know, I might even put it on the website. We'll see. Um, in the event that you cannot uh, get access to that or you want more, you can always go to goiguide.com, and you can go to resources. So I hope you guys can see my screen here in the top right-hand corner. When you're on goiguide.com, you're going to see resources. And then if you mouse down, there will be a, a menu item that says technical training. And if you go there, you're going to see that number two on this page is stitch training. So this has got some, some you know, sort of simple um, demonstrations of stuff. Uh, it kind of walks you through some important features. Um, there's, a, there's a lot in Stitch, to be honest, um, that you can do, but it's also extremely simple software. So even if you don't, you know, if you get overwhelmed by the details with what I'm about to show you today, which can happen, don't worry about it. It's very simple um, if you've never used it before. So a lot of you may be new. Maybe you just got your camera. Maybe you don't even have your camera yet. Um, if that's the case, um, don't worry. Stitch is very simple. It really only does a few super simple things. And I'm going to show you something else. So on our website now, if you go to resources and you go to downloads, you can download Stitch. There's obviously a version for Windows and a version for Mac. But you can also download um, some sample data. So if any of you uh, don't have a camera yet and you just want to mess around because you're excited, you can download the Stitch software and some sample data and mess around with some of the stuff we're doing today and get ready. Um, as a general description of what Stitch does, Stitch allows you to take the data that you capture from the camera and process it or configure it before sending it in to be drafted and, and before a virtual tour is created. So the reason Stitch is called Stitch is that it takes all of the, the image data and it stitches it all together. So that's why it's called that. So um, the uh, process of stitching means taking these those cool fisheye images that you see and actually stretching them out and then stitching them together. So that's why Stitch is called Stitch. But Stitch does that all automatically. You don't have to do anything there. It's going to do that all for you, um, all when you load up your data you know, for the first time in the software. What Stitch really does is it gives you some control. It gives you a way to configure um, your your tour before it gets drafted. So what I mean by configure is that you can um, hide or show panoramas. So you can choose which ones are seen by you know, the public on the tour later. You can um, add instructions for room labels. Um, you can um, edit certain variables like exterior wall thickness. You can configure different floors. You can add buildings. You can do all sorts of stuff. So um, that's really what Stitch does. It allows you to configure the tour uh, before you send it in. Because not all, but most of the stuff I just mentioned can be configured later. So you could, in theory, completely skip it all. Most people don't do that because it's very easy. But you could. You could do that, um, and it will work just fine. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do that stuff today by opening Stitch and loading up some data. Should be fun. And yes, Peter, I see your question, and we'll totally... Totally go over that, no problem. Part of um, Stitch, actually we'll just address it in part now, um, is that 
uh, it's going to give you updates. So the first time you load Stitch, um, so I've just started up the software here, and you can see it, there's nothing to really look at because <laughs> I haven't loaded any data yet. Um, and uh, if you, it auto updates basically. Stitch does a, um, a little check every time you load it and it will say, hey, there's a new version of Stitch. Would you like to download it? So that's convenient. It's very easy. You don't have to go out of your way to find updates. But Stitch is really cool. Every time you load data, it will actually tell you if the firmware on your camera that shot that data is old. It actually does a little check and it'll say, hey, there's a new firmware version. Why don't you get it? And it even has a little, little tool built in to allow you to download it right there onto your USB drive. So it's quite cool. So I probably will get that message, actually, because I'm going to load up some data now. So I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but I will describe it fully. Um, when you're loading data into Stitch, what you're going to do is you're going to copy a project folder from the USB drive of the camera onto your computer, preferably, and then you're going to open that project folder. So like I said, that's, that's it. That's all there is to it. But I'm going to show you what that looks like <laughs> because it's very simple. Um, without explaining much else. Uh, but this can be a little problematic depending on the type of computer you have. I'll give you an example. Like where do you where do you copy it on your computer? Onto your desktop, onto your hard drive? You put it wherever you want. It's your computer. So I can't really tell you what to do, but you could put it on your desktop if you don't have any other choice. Either way, I'm going to load up a project. So in order to do that, I have to click the button in the top left-hand corner of the screen. So I'll bring it closer to the center just so you guys can see what I'm doing. So that's this button here that my cursor is near, and it says... Um, load projects when you mouse over it. And it looks like a little house in a folder. So if I click that button, it will open up a little Explorer uh, window on, um, on a Windows computer or a Finder window on a Mac. And then I can select a project folder. So I already have one like ready to go, obviously. I'm prepared for this webinar. <laughs> so I'm going to select the folder and then I'm going to choose, like by clicking on it once, and then I'm going to choose select. So what that does is you can see there was a little loading screen and it um, loaded up uh, a bunch of data that you can now see. Um, and I'm just going to zoom in on it and then full screen. Hold on. There we go. So what you're seeing here is a bunch of data that I captured um, at a model home uh, maybe a year ago, two years ago. I can't remember now. Um, and what you'll probably notice right off the bat is that, you know, you can see some structure here. It looks... It looks like a floor plan, more or less. And that's kind of what you want when you're loading data into Stitch. So um, depending on you know, your experience level with using the camera, you may or may not have done all this data alignment on site. And if you didn't, then it's not going to look this pretty. It's going to be um, a bit messier. But if you've done your data alignment on site, you're going to see that a lot of the data is um, exactly, well, all the data is exactly as you left it. So Apparently, I aligned this on site. That's pretty cool. Um, now, what I'm going to do to start is I'm going to walk you through all the controls. So this is a bit of a snooze fest. You might get bored, but um, I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. Uh, we're going to go through each of the UI elements. I'm going to show you all the little bells and whistles. So the first thing I want you to look at is at the top of the screen where you see all the icons and buttons. So we're going to go through every single one of these. So we did the first one the load project button. So you need to click that to load a project. So we've already done that. And this is what it looks like when you do it successfully. The button next to it is the saved project button. So I'll just show you something uh, on screen here. If I do something like move this data from here to here, the software is going to auto save that. But if I want to just be very, very certain that that action that I took is saved, I can click that save button and it will manually save. And you may or may not be able to see the little thing in the top right-hand corner that says Project Saved. So that's all it is. It's a save button. But the cool thing is that Stitch auto-saves anyway. So <laughs> even if you never hit that Save button, um, if you load the project again later without having saved it, it'll say, hey, do you want to load the auto-saved version? And you could just say yes. So that's um, quite handy. It's very, very convenient. The next button to the right of the Save button is the Export Project button. Now, what the um, eagle-eyed among you may have already noticed is that every time I hover my mouse cursor over the, one of these buttons, it tells me what it does. You know, you get a little, a little tool tip there. And next to that name, there will be a hotkey. So all, all of these buttons, for the most part, have hotkeys. Um, I'm going to show you where to find all of those in a big list later, but 
that's what that means. We see an X in the brackets, or for save, it's Control S. Those are hotkeys to do that without clicking. So the next button over is the Export Project button. So the Export Project button is the button that you click when you're done. Once you've done all the things you want to do in here, you're going to click that button, and then what Stitch is going to do is it's going to take all of the changes that you've made, and it's going to make them a reality by creating a separate file that um, has all the uh, images and, and data all configured the way you want. And that file is what you send uh, in for drafting. So what this means, if we're going to get a little weird and technical, is that this is a non-destructive process. It's a bit like Adobe Lightroom. So when you're doing things um, in Stitch, you're not, you're not doing anything uh, other than just asking Stitch to do something for you later. So if you change an image and you make it um, horrendously uh, off-colored, actually, I'll just do that and show you here. Well, let's just make this really hideous. We'll just add some, actually, that doesn't even look that bad. That's funny. All right, here, we'll take all the color out and make it look really sad. There we go. Okay, so, oh no, I've made it black and white. I've ruined the photo. Okay, no, you haven't. It's, this is non-destructive. So if I click export, it will actually perform this edit and export it to that file. But at any time, I can go back and I can change the slider or any options back to the way they were. And it will, and then I can export again. So it's a, it's a non-destructive process. It's not like Photoshop. So it's very safe, very safe. There's only one, one thing you can do that's destructive. <laughs> and I'll just show it to you so you don't do it. If you um, right click on any of the folders over here in this folder tree, which we'll get to after we do the toolbar, there is the option to delete. If you delete something, it literally removes it from your computer. It is deleted. So don't delete things unless you want to hide evidence. Don't delete anything. Um, you have the option to hide any panoramas you create. When you're capturing uh, all these panos, you have full control over what people see and what they don't see on the tour by using um, the hide option. So there's really no reason to ever delete something um, unless you don't want the drafters to see it, which is fine. Okay, so the export button um, is extremely important. If you only ever click one button in this whole interface, that's the one because it's the, it's the minimum. You, you have to click that export button to create that special file that you send in for drafting. So the whole thing falls apart without it. Um, the next button over is the move and rotate scans button. So what you're gonna notice is that this one is auto selected by default. So when you load up the software, this is the one that will already be clicked. And what this button allows you to do is exactly what it, it says it, it allows you to do, move and rotate scans. So I'll just zoom in here and show you what it does. So you can't see, you can't see my hands, but I'm, I'm using a mouse, a two button or three button mouse, and I'm using the left click on my mouse and I'm left clicking and dragging and holding the left click and I can move a scan around. So it's probably a bit choppy on your end, but basically it's, I'm, I'm taking a single panorama or scan and I'm moving it around. If I right click and drag, it will rotate. So that is um, how you can align data. So aligning data is one of the big things that you're probably gonna wanna do in Stitch. So I'm gonna give you a really quick example of that and then we'll kind of dive into it later. So you can kind of see that this, I hope you can see that this is in the wrong spot. So if I were to wanna put this in the right spot, I would move it and then I would rotate it and then I would place it where it belongs relative to the rest of the data. So that's what, what moving and rotating is for. It's so that you can align your data before you send it into us. So if your data is not aligned properly, there is a chance that the drafters won't be able to figure it out and they may refuse it. Um, so you wanna have your data aligned as best you can. So this, this panorama, I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is an outdoor pano um, and it is in the wrong spot. And I know it's in the wrong spot because this is the front of the house and this shows me the back of the house. So I'm gonna actually align it for you. So I'm gonna move it over here and put it in place. There you go, that's where it goes. So that's what, and that's an actual uh, data alignment that I just did. Um, the next button over, if you look at the toolbar, is going to be the add notes button. So if I click it, what will happen is that this button will now be selected. So I can't move and rotate data anymore. It doesn't work. So if you're, if you're trying to move data and it's not working, that's probably why you probably just selected another button. But you'd wanna use this add notes button to add um, any information you want to, you know, the floor plan specifically. So I'm just going to show you a quick example. Of that. 
There might be other reasons why you might want to do this, but um, the primary reason is to add a, add a room label for the drafters. So with this selected, if I double click anywhere on this data, I can now add a little text label. So I'm going to say, um, I'm going to type in the word den. So now that I've labeled this, I've basically said to the draft people, this should be called the den. Like they, they're going to read this and they're going to know that. They're going to say, oh, okay, he wants it called den. That's cool. So that's a really good reason to use it. I don't know what other reason you might have, but you can put any text you want anywhere you want on the floor plan um, using the add notes um, function. So the next button over is the set initial pano angle button. So this one's a little funky. <laughs> I'm going to show you how it works, but it relates to this blue box. So um, if you look at the image, there should always be, for the most part, with one exception, a blue box somewhere on the image. And this represents the first thing that people will see when they click on the pano. Now, this blue box is almost always going to be the very first thing you pointed the camera at, unless you are, have already changed it. Um, so what that means is that, and then you probably, have, a lot of you probably already heard me say this, but when you're shooting, it's a good idea to always point the camera um, at something important for your first shot. That way, the initial um, pano angle, what you, the first thing you see when you load up the pano, will be, you know, already configured. You don't have to do it later. But there are times where you might change your mind, or for other reasons, you pointed the camera at something initially that um, wasn't particularly attractive, and you can change this you know, um, right here in Stitch. And you can also actually change it later on the portal, which is pretty cool. But the way you do that uh, is you click on the button that says um, set initial pano angle. And then if you mouse over the preview image, you can see I have a white box. So I, what I, what I want to do is line up the white box over something I think is attractive, which I would like to configure as my first angle. And then I click. And you can see now it's moved the blue box over. And now that will be the initial starting position. So using this, you can configure um, the first thing that people see when they click on a dot on the floor plan. So I don't have an eye guide handy to show you, but imagine for a moment you're looking at the actual virtual tour. You have a floor plan on the left, and you have visuals on the right. So there are two ways to navigate. One way is by looking at the actual 360s and then clicking almost like forward as though you're walking through the space. This will not affect that, because the way that navigation works is whatever direction you're currently facing, will be facing the same direction with you when you move forward to mimic like a walking sort of thing. This initial panel angle only is only um, relevant when you click on the floor plan, you know, you can actually click on the dot. And a lot of people use the tours this way because they're curious about very specific spaces. They say to themselves, oh, I'd like to see the kitchen. So when they look at the floor plan and see the kitchen, they click on it. And if you configure this properly, the first thing they will see when they click on the kitchen is the, you know, nice, beautiful cupboards as opposed to say like a blank wall to the left of the fridge or something that might be less preferable. So moving right along the toolbar, you're gonna to see four buttons in a row. All these buttons are optional um, and they're kind of frills, but they're very cool. So I'm gonna show you what they do. So what I'm gonna do is select a panorama, I've just picked this one, and then I'm gonna click on the, uh, button that looks like a magic magnet. I want you to just watch what happens. I hope it comes across. <laughs> so I hope that was visible. Basically what it does is it snaps the panoramas into place. So every so often you're gonna have a panorama in the middle of nowhere and if you click the magic magnet it'll snap it into place. So these are basically automatic alignment tools. So what you can do with these tools is align um, data for a property um, you know, one sort of piece at a time or one scan at a time, or you can do the entire thing at once. So I skipped one. There's another um, uh, button here that says arrange all scans. It's like a magic wand with sparkles or stars. So what that one does is it does the magic magnet. It just does it in order. So what you all have probably noticed at this point is that when you're shooting with the eye guide camera, it numbers all of your panoramas because although the system is nonlinear, you can shoot in whatever order you want, Typically, people shoot in a, in a logical sequence. They don't want to waste effort, so they move from position to position as in closest space to closest space without you know, going to um, strange areas of the house they have that are nowhere near what they've previously shot. So the software knows what the order is because it knows the order you shot them, and they're all numbered as well. So what it will do if you click the magic wand button is it will try to arrange them all one by one in order. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Here, we can give it a try because we can undo it. 
So if I click it, it's going to say, are these scans in the correct position? And I can go through and confirm them one by one, or I can just click yes to all, and it will just have a go at putting them all together um, all on its own. And yeah, it did an okay job. I mean, not fantastic. Oh, I see. It's the garage that it messed up. Now, that's very common uh, because it's uh, very challenging um, when the um, one position doesn't, it can't uh, see another position very well. So you can actually see that uh, here perfectly because you can see this space. Um, this doesn't have line of sight to here. There's very little data in common from one scan to the next. So I can see that was challenging. But you can see that it did a pretty good job. It put everything together more or less perfectly. Um, the nice thing is that if you click that magic wand button and it's a train wreck and it doesn't look very good, you can always click undo um, and it will go back to the way it was. So. So we're jumping ahead a little bit, but the two arrows toward the end of the toolbar, toward the right side, those are undo and redo. And you can click them anytime and undo any actions you've done. It's quite cool. So there's another icon that has a magnet. So there's um, the magic magnet with the sparkles, and then there's a regular magnet. The regular magnet is going to do the exact same thing as the mag magic magnet, but just locally. So I'm just going to move this data a little bit, and I'm going to click the magic magnet, and hopefully you guys can see it snap into place. But if I move this way over here, and I click the little magnet, it doesn't work. So what it does is it attempts to align the data to something that's close to it. So you can use these as you know interchangeably. It doesn't matter whichever one you find more convenient. Most people just use the sparkly magnet because it works better. Um, the next button to the right is uh, the last one for moving data, and it's square up floor. And all it does, I don't even know, hold on, let me show you. I'll, I'll intentionally skew this a little bit so you can see this whole section now is rotated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this button, and I hope you can see what happens. There you go. All it does is write, write it up. So if you've already aligned your your all your panoramas to be right angles to the sides of the screen, you've already straightened it out, it literally will do nothing. You won't even notice that it does anything. <laughs> uh, but it's a handy tool. So um, the next button to the right of the Square Up tool is the Paint Bucket button. So this one's fun. Uh, it doesn't do um, anything to the data. It just changes the way it looks. So it mimics the Coverage button in, uh, in Survey. So the Coverage button in Survey does, does this. It shades everything in so that you can kind of see where you've been and where you haven't. So what you've probably noticed is that some areas are kind of green or black or whatever, and some are, um, you know, uh, you know, blue or, or black and they have nothing in them. So areas that are black are areas where there is no data. So I'll give you an example. There's a, an area over here um, that's a black rectangle. I'll try to zoom in on it. And that's a fireplace. So I didn't measure that, and that's OK. But what this tool does, it'll, it gives you the opportunity to kind of analyze what you've done and figure out if you should have gathered more data or not. At this point, if you're in Stitch, it's already too late. You've already left the house. But it can still be a useful tool for self-analysis. So I'll give you an example. If I remove this panorama, I can then look at the rest of the data and see if I still had enough um, you know, to hit all the walls and, and possibly draw a floor plan. So what I could do is I could subtract panos and see if I could have saved myself some time, um, if that's important to you. So this doesn't change the data in any way. It doesn't do anything other than just shade everything in a little bit so you can kind of see where you've been and where you haven't been. The next button is quite handy. So if I zoom out or zoom too far in or whatever, I can click the magnifying glass, and it will just fit everything on screen. So if you accidentally zoom in too far and you've lost all your data, no big deal. Just click the magnifying glass or the zoom to fit tool, and it will just put it all on screen for you. The next button is a pretty important one. It's the adjust panoramas button, and it looks like a wizard hat. When you click it, it's going to bring up a screen. So I already kind of spoiled this one by loading it already. But what you can see is that it shows a really big preview image. And then there's a whole bunch of sliders. So the formatting on my screen is a little weird because I'm doing this all on a 4K TV. It'll probably look a little different for you, uh, depending on the resolution of your monitor. But you're going to have two uh, banks of sliders. One that says adjust fisheye alignment, and then one um, that says adjust color. So the adjust fisheye alignment um, doesn't need any, almost any uh, modifications almost ever. 
it basically everything is automatic. It auto levels the panorama, stitch auto stitches them. But every so often, you might need them. So I'll kind of show you what they do. So if you slide the vertical slider, I don't know if this is actually going to be visible, but if you um, use this, you can basically change how level the panorama is. Roll, pitch, and yaw affect single parts of the image, as in one section, not the whole thing. The only reason you would ever want to use this is to um, fix a mistake that you've made. So let's suppose you're on site and you're shooting and you are um, basically uh, you know, in a hurry and you're rotating the camera and you accidentally misrotate it and you don't notice. When you get back, what you're going to see is that um, one of the images um, will be off. It'll look a bit like this. You might see a doubling. You might see a seam. It'll look wrong. So and that means the software couldn't fix it. So you can artificially move the slider until it um, it make you know it goes back to where it, it kind of should be. You won't be using an optimal part of the lens, and it might be slightly flawed, but you can kind of rescue a messed up panorama using these tools. So that's the only time you would ever really use it is if you um, you know made a mistake on site and you want to try to fix it later. And there's no way for me to tell you how to fix it because it really depends. It's a combination of a bunch of these sliders, um, and it's going to be different for each image. The adjust color um, section uh, is um, exactly what it looks like. It's something very similar to Photoshop. You can change brightness, you can change contrast, you can change saturation. Again, I can't tell you what to do here. You have to choose for yourself. Um, but this is where you can customize your look. I already know in the chat there's probably, yes, okay, there's already a question about this, so I'll just answer this one now. So if you want to save a preset, as in you, you, you have a certain type of adjustment that you like, you know, you're always adding a certain amount of brightness, you're, you know, you're always doing the same thing, you think to yourself, okay, I really want to just make this a preset and apply it to everything. What you do is um, set your... Uh, your adjustments to zero. I don't know why it's not working for me, there we go. And then think about what, what it is that you want to achieve. So if you want to do a brightness boost, you push the brightness up. If you want to do a contrast boost, you could boost the contrast. If you like a little bit more of a mellow image, you drop the saturation. And then let's suppose this is, this is a good setup. So ignore the white balance because this isn't affected by this. If you um, set uh, these sliders to be where they are with these numbers, so you can control the numbers precisely as well, you can choose, um, basically, over here under presets, you can choose a preset. There's three of them and a clipboard, just for a quick copy and paste. But once you choose set one, you can choose save, and it will now save these values relatively. So here's where it gets very confusing. If you have auto adjustments turned on, like I said, these adjustments are relative. So it won't do um, the this adjustment, then do auto, because that would erase your adjustment. What it will do is it will do auto first, and then it will apply this adjustment according to what you just specified. So that's a complicated way of saying, if you you know take an image that you see here and you just boost the brightness to where you like it, and then you click save, that will work, but you have to remember that not every image um, is going to get uh, the same adjustment because auto adjustments are on. So with auto adjustments on, it's going to probably boost the brightness anyway. In most cases, it does. Um, so you have to bear that in mind. But that's basically all you do. Do an adjustment, click Save, and you can set it to one of three presets. And then if you want to load it, you just click Load, and it will load that on top of whatever you've got there. Um, what you can do as well uh, is um, paste to all. So if I choose a preset, um, and I load it up, and I choose Paste to all, it will just apply it to all of the panoramas. But most of the time, you're already gonna know what you want. So when I load up panoramas, or once you've gained some experience, I should say, so initially you might not know, but once you've done maybe 10, 15 eye guides, what you're gonna find is that you're just repeating yourself. You're doing the same things over and over. You're bringing all the panos in, you're just adding a little bit of brightness and contrast to every single one or whatever it is that you like. You're gonna think, I wish there was a faster way. So I'll show you the faster way. So up in the top right-hand corner of um, the toolbar, there is a wrench and a screwdriver. If you click it, you will see that there's some options here. So they're super simple. You can um, change from metric to imperial, for example. You can um, change your export options. There's a little sharpening slider here. 
and there's also an auto preset application. So you can choose setting one, two, or three. So if you're always adding brightness, all you have to do is go into the adjustment screen, add brightness, save it to preset one, and then come here and set it so that every time you load a property, it applies preset one. And it might take a little fiddling, and the preset might not be perfect on every panorama. Like some, it might blow some out, like think too bright, it might darken some down, who knows, it depends on what you choose, but um, that's how you configure it so that it automatically applies the preset to all your panos without you actually having to do it you know, manually for each pano or even clicking the uh, paste to all button that you'll find here. There's some advanced controls in addition to the sliders. You've got levels and you've got gamma. Sometimes you'll need those if you really want to recover like a weird panorama, something really strange where you've got a lot of high contrast and it just doesn't look right and you're really struggling. Um, these can sometimes be a bit useful. What you will notice is that there's some extra buttons um, down at the bottom. So there's revert. If you click that, the panorama will go back to what it originally was. There's hide in eye guide. So if I click that, what will happen is that it will just um, skip to the next panorama. And then if you look in the folder tree, the previous panorama that I, I was looking at in, in the adjust uh, pano and color screen is now red. So the folder name is now red. So that, that signifies that that panorama will now be hidden on the tour. So this window is designed um, with workflow in mind. It's designed to load up and then just go through every single panorama one by one. And you can and you you know you can edit them, or if you don't want to edit them, you think, well, no one's ever going to see this, you can hide it right from here by pushing that button, which is very convenient. And you'll notice there's a next and previous pano button down here, and that's how you're going to cycle through all the panoramas one by one. There's also a preview button. There we go. If you click that, what you're going to get is an approximation of what the panorama looks like. And this is just, just for your convenience, just so you can kind of get a feel for it. Um, it may not be a perfect representation of exactly what the panorama looks like. Um, it might, because it's a, it's a smaller, faster preview, so it might be a little bit off. Um, if you want to see what the actual panorama would look like, uh, you can click Done. And then you can click on the uh, Take Snapshots button. So I saw it in the chat. Someone asked me to talk about that. Yes, perfect, I will. So if you go look at the sample properties on Go Eye Guide in the residential real estate section, um, three out of four of them, um, one, this is one of them actually, uh, have images, like still pictures taken with the Eye Guide camera. It takes good pictures. Um, they're limited by resolution. They're not like super high resolution or anything, but they look good and they match the eye guide, which is quite nice. There's a lot of consistency there when you use them. Uh, but the way that you get still images from, you know, uh, 360s is a little different than just, you know, just saying I would like a still image. You, you have to tell the software what the still image should be because if you think about it, you've got unlimited compositional possibilities here. You can look up or down or left or right. So in order to to choose what gets turned into a still image, uh, there's a special tool, and it is the Take Snapshots tool. So on the toolbar, there's a little camera, and when you click it, it will load up a, a preview. So this preview is different than the other preview. It's better. All the seams are smoothed out, uh, and this is the actual panorama as it would appear on the tour. So what you'll notice is that it is in a window. So whatever is in that window can be captured as a, a still image. With, it, with a few variables. So the way that you do that is that you, you compose, essentially, an image by um, putting on screen what it is that you want to capture and then tapping the Capture button. And then I hope you guys can see this. There's a thing that says, you've just saved an image to your computer. So all it does is save a JPEG straight to your computer so that you can look at it. Um, but you've got a few options here. One is aspect ratio. You can change to 3 by 2 or 16 by 9. And you've got this grid overlay that goes on top. So um, if anyone here is not a particularly experienced real estate photographer, um, they're just getting started, the number one thing you can do to um, make your images look professional would be to align your vertical lines, and that's what this grid is for. So what I mean by vertical lines, I'll find you one here. Um, there you go, this doorway's got a few. All of the lines that are supposed to be vertical in an image should be as close to perfectly vertical as you can get them. And that means they shouldn't converge toward the top of the screen or converge toward the bottom. So I'll show you what I mean. If I look down, what you're going to see is that all the images on screen are converging, or sorry, all the lines are converging toward the bottom of the screen. They're not straight. If I look up, 
you're going to see all the vertical lines are now perfectly vertical. And if I keep looking up, you're going to see now all the vertical lines will converge toward the top of the screen. So we don't want converging vertical lines. We want them to be perfectly straight up and down. The number one thing that differentiates, you know, sort of amateurish photography from um, really good photography, professional looking photography, is just that vertical lines. Everything else is important, like <laughs> exposure is important and composition is important, but they're not as important as straight vertical lines. You can take an absolutely garbage camera, your cell phone, it doesn't matter, and as long as your vertical lines are nice and straight, your images will look good. They will look professional. Um, with a few exceptions, like if you take a picture um, of a toilet. Uh, is it possible to allow software developers saving as DNG versus JPEG? Okay, so this comes up all the time. It's raw versus JPEG. So raw files are awesome because they save a lot of extra information. The main benefit with a raw file is going to be white balance, um, which you can just do after the fact. So you can completely blow it on site and you can still fix it later. So white balance is essentially a non-issue with this camera because the auto white balance is very, very good and it has automatic auto white balance um, equalization. So white balance is, is, isn't as important as you'd think. And with exposure, what happens is that um, you actually get more dynamic range out of a fused HDR JPEG, a series of JPEGs that are fused into an HDR composite than you do with a RAW file. So what it comes down to is um, it's a trade-off. So yes, you have the ability to edit more on a RAW file later, but the size of the RAW file is humongous compared to a JPEG, which can be captured and fused on site in seconds. So it's a trade-off in data size and time. So if you were to capture images with the camera in DNG or whatever the Canon RAW file is, like a CR2 or something, um, you would be capturing so much data that it would, the camera would essentially be unusable. And there's a lot of factors. It's the right time to the SD card. It's the, because we're taking images after it, like nine images per um, per panorama, right? And that's just repeated over and over for 100 panoramas. That's that's bonkers. That's too much data. So it's just not practical to shoot in RAW. And also, there's very little benefit because the JPEGs are quite good. They actually have a higher dynamic range than just one RAW file would. So the only thing you could really do to offset that would be to take multiple um, raw files, which would make things even worse <laughs> and compound the data problem. And then it, with raw, it, the, the issues just keep going. Like as soon as you load it into the software, you would then have to process the raw files, turn them into JPEGs. That's extra time. So that's an extra, I mean, for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of JPEGs, that's a lot. And then you'd have to stitch them. Um, all of that to say that um, raw files aren't supported. And um, JPEG just makes sense for now until um, data storage and the actual um, processing power of uh, computers uh, gets greater. Uh, I forget what I was doing. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, so still images. So you can capture some pretty amazing still images with the camera, uh, but the camera will not do it automatically for you. It's, it's on you. So if you are not um, trying to make good images, then you will not get good images. If you're trying your best to create interesting, compelling images, then you're going to get you're going to get pretty good images. The other thing that makes this this work a lot better, but you can really take it to a bad place, is the field of view slider. So it's just a, it's just a zoom slider, um, but it gives you it gives you a lot to work with. So if you zoom out, you can see that this is really stretched. Now there there are some panoramas that suit that, you know that that you could pull a still image out zoomed out this far and it would be fine. But what this really is for is not so you can make the room look like a concert hall. It's so that you can just get the compositional freedom to get the shot that you want. Um, because you might crop something out of this. And you know the um, position of a panorama or a still picture might not have been ideal on site. Um, and you might not know. It's hard, much harder to compose with this camera for still images than it is with another camera because you do so much recomposition later. So yeah, my official advice is watch this one. Don't zoom out too much because it starts to get <laughs> really stretched on the edges. Um, so what this tool allows you to do is take still images, you can save them off of uh, any of the panoramas onto your computer, and you can basically have still images. So here, let me just check how much time we have because I've been yapping away. All right, I'm going to wrap this up. But uh, when you are using this tool, um, it's a good idea to not pull images from the panoramas themselves. You should use the still picture button. Um, 
in survey, so when, on your smart device when you're shooting, you're going to see a little, a little button that looks like an aperture. What that does is it just shoots one part of a panorama, so you don't have to shoot the whole thing just to save you some time, and then you can pull a still image from that. Um, often the reason that's better is not because it's faster in that way, it's because you can back the camera up into a corner and take a picture into the room to get a better natural field of view. It's um, not a great situation to have to take a still image from a panorama taken, say, like one foot from a bed. It looks weird. You have to really zoom out a lot to get a normal photo. But if you just pick up the camera, back up into the corner and press that still picture button, you'll have a much more natural looking still photo later. That's something that you should uh, practice and experiment with if you plan to use this camera for still photos. It's really easy and it's super fast, but you kind of have to wrap your head around the workflow because you have to shoot your panorama, then back up into a corner, shoot a still, and then kind of move on without just shooting straight up panoramas for the whole shoot. Okay, cool. Let's see. Was there any buttons left? Yeah, there's a couple left. So undo and redo, we talked about those. They undo and redo any actions that you've taken. There is a um, hints button. If you click it, it will give you some suggestions uh, on um, things it thinks you might do better in terms of color adjustments. So that'll only give you suggestions if there's problems. So if it says no hint for now, don't worry about it. Um, the settings we already talked about, there's um, a sharpness slider. My recommendation would be just keep it in the middle, but if you really want to push it, you certainly can if you like that look. You can change from metric to imperial, and then you can apply presets. There is a checkbox here that says select initial pano and angle. So if this is checked, that means it will not let you export without selecting the initial pano and angle. So the initial pano is the very first um, panorama that people see when they load up the tour. So if you don't care, you can turn that off, but if you do care, um, you can easily set the very first panel that people see by right-clicking over here on the folder tree and then choosing set initial panel. So if you do that, it, you can't see on my screen because the scaling is weird, but there will be an orange dot that will appear on this little panel folder uh, signifying that that is the very first panel that people will see. If you don't configure it or if you configure it incorrectly, no big deal. <laughs> you can always configure it later on the iGUIDE user portal uh, anytime you want uh, without any issues. So um, the folder tree over here on the left uh, has a lot of interesting hidden stuff in it. So what you're going to notice is that it is a um, folder structure that nests. So you've got the project at the very top, and you've got buildings underneath it, and then within a building you're going to have floors, and within a floor you're going to have panoramas. So if you were to go look at the actual data on the USB driver on your computer, you would see that it actually looks like this. You're going to have a project folder name, and then inside that you're going to have um, subfolders corresponding to floors and to panos. So when you actually look at the data, it, that's why it looks like this. It's, it's basically mirroring the folder structure that happens when you capture the data. Um, you can right click on anything here and get extra options. So if you don't remember anything else <laughs> from this whole webinar, you remember one thing other than click the export button, it's to right click on stuff because you'll find things. If you right click on any panorama, you get a little menu and it's got lots of awesome stuff in it. You can rename the panorama should you want to. You can hide in the eye guide. So I'll do that now and show you what it looks like. If I click hide in eye guide, changes it to red. That means no one will see it on the tour. Uh, Peter, the still images are saved in the original project folder in a folder called snapshots. And you can upload them to the gallery um, when you're uploading to the portal. So if you're on the, um, if you're you know creating your eye guide and you scroll down, you're gonna see there's a, a literally a, uh, like a box and it says gallery images and you can add them there. If you don't add them there, it doesn't matter. You can always add them later at any time. On the eye guide portal, you'll have a property, you know, be in um, your my eye guides list. There's a button that says gallery. If you click it, you can upload right there. And you can upload still images from whatever you want. Your own camera, DSLR, your cell phone. Don't do your cell phone, but <laughs> the iGUIDE camera, the agent's cell phone, I mean, whatever, you know. Um, when you right-click, you're also going to get a few options that will probably not make sense. There's open folder. I'm not going to go into detail here. That's a separate webinar, but you can actually open the very folder that contains the data and have a look at the actual fisheye images. And edit them if you want to. So that's pretty cool. So you can edit out reflections and some other weird stuff. You can reload, which means that um, basically it will reprocess this preview image for you. You can uh, re-import, which does something very similar. You can delete. Never do this. Like I said earlier, if you delete it, it is gone from your computer forever. 
you can re reverse camera rotation, which is kind of neat. Here, I'll show you what it looks like. We can do a little pretend thing here. So if I right click on this and choose reverse, you, what you probably should be able to see here is that the, this data looks a bit off. Like this doesn't look like a representation of a room. So if, if you've just started, you just got your camera and you accidentally rotate the camera counterclockwise instead of clockwise, and you don't notice until here, no big deal. You can just right click on the panorama here in the folder tree and choose reverse camera rotation and it will fix it for you. And everybody makes that mistake when they first start. So it's totally, totally normal. Uh, and then the last thing was that set initial pano that I had mentioned earlier. So in addition to this, there's some hidden stuff in here that you wouldn't know unless someone told you. So I'm gonna tell you right now. If you click and drag, for example, a panorama, you can bring it from one floor to another. So what I've done is I've clicked panorama 19 and now I'm holding the left mouse button and I'm dragging it onto the second floor. I failed to do that, I almost dragged it. There we go, so I've dragged it over. So let's suppose you're at a shoot and you shoot the whole first floor and then you go up to the second floor and you shoot a panorama and then you realize, whoops, I forgot to make a second floor. You don't really need to reshoot that panorama. You can always just move it over later. Um, this is especially handy for split level houses. Sometimes when you're shooting them, they're just nonsense. They're like one level and then three steps up and another level and then five steps up and two more levels. And you, it's, you know, it, you're kind of like, what, what, what's a floor here? I don't know where to put these. Don't worry about it. You can just figure it out later um, by moving panoramas from one floor to another. And then if you really want as well, you can right click on the main building here uh, at the top uh, of the folder tree and choose add a floor. So let's suppose that you accidentally shot two, you know, two floors um, on one for some weird reason. No big deal. You can always just create a floor, rename it by again, right clicking and choosing rename, uh, renaming that floor to, you know, second floor and then just dragging your panos over. This can be super handy for, you know, bigger, weirder spaces. So let's suppose you've got like a, you're doing a giant banquet hall and you know, you're kind of thinking, oh, here, I'll shoot the, I'll shoot the event center and then I'll go over here and I'll shoot the lobby and you put them on separate floors. And then later you realize that doesn't make any sense. It's all one floor. <laughs> no big deal. You can just combine them later. It's fine. Um, another interesting trick that you can use that's very handy is you can actually create separate buildings. So when you're shooting in survey, uh, you're typically going to just create floors. So let's suppose you have a, um, a guest house. So you would do your floors, just as you would normally on the main house, main floor, second floor, basement, whatever it's got. Then when you go over to the guest house, you would just create a floor called guest house, you know, main floor or guest house, second floor. So when you load it into this software, what you can do is you can right click on the project name and you can choose add a building. If you choose add building, you can just call it guest house and then move the floors into guest house and call them, you know, main floor uh, and second floor. That's the preferable way to do it because what it does is it allows you to um, configure that building with a separate um, set of like wall thicknesses and, and it'll get separate square footage calculations. So um, another cool thing that you can do if you click on the project name is that there is a comment section and you can type anything you want in here. You know, So if you've got some, some notes that you want to leave for the drafters, this is the place to put them. And the reason I say that is that you can certainly send an email and you can so create a support ticket, but the person who's drafting this property has to see the notes that are in here because they're literally like the first thing they see as soon as they load it up in their drafting software is the notes. So if you want to communicate something, this is the place to do it because you know it will get to the person who needs to see it. It also gets attached to the file. So it's not like it can get lost. It's just there like, you know, um, for the life of the data, which is awesome. If you click on the uh, main building, this is just left clicking by the way, you're gonna get uh, an option. You can set the exterior wall thickness here. So if you forgot uh, to do it on site, no big deal, you just put it in here. Um, and you can also, if you click on the floor, uh, set the wall thickness here. So um, wall thickness is uh, important, but setting it for the entire property is what's important, not necessarily setting it per floor. So without going into great detail, I will say that Always include the exterior wall thickness for properties that are detached. Never include it for ones that are attached, like townhomes or condos, uh, and you'll be totally safe. And don't bother to include the exterior wall thickness per floor unless you've got some really good reason to do it. And you may, you know, there might be a house that's been renovated and it has a new second floor, 
and maybe um, that second floor wasn't originally there, so it has a completely different wall thickness than the first floor, that would be a perfect example of when you'd use it. But if you set the wall thickness for the whole property, what happens is it just inherits it to every floor. So I'll show you what that looks like. If I put it in for this building, we're gonna put it in as um, 10. And then I go to the exterior wall thickness for the floor, it now says 10 inherited. So if you add it for the project, it just adds it in for every floor. Okay, where are we doing for time? Okay, eight minutes, I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> I'll try to move fast. Um, you can move panoramas up and down in this list as well. So let's suppose that I shoot my first panorama for some weird reason in a back bedroom, you know, because they're, they're busy and they're staging the front area, who knows, right? I can um, then click and drag that panorama to be where it is supposed to go in the list from top to bottom. And what you want is you want the panoramas to be in an order that is that makes sense from top to bottom if you enable autoplay. This is where it gets weird. So typically when people are viewing the eye guide, they look at a room and they say, oh, the kitchen, and they click on it and they look at it. Because that's what home buyers do. They're looking for information specifically, you know, about spaces and um, they, they may navigate visually or they may navigate, you know, via the, um, uh, the floor plan. But what you'll often have happen is that someone like uh, an agent or someone who's kind of demoing the property will just press the autoplay button on the tour and just let it cycle through all the panels. Maybe they're doing a trade show or they're doing a, a demo where they're just going to talk over it or whatever. So that's the order that it plays in autoplay is the order you see here from top to bottom. So if you shoot the property in a, in a like a logical sequence, no problem. It'll be already in a good order, right? From the front door all the way around the house to, to when you finish. So if you need to configure it, that's who you'd be configuring it for. Someone who would press that autoplay button, typically an agent, homeowners like never bother because it takes about a minute per panel, which would take you like <laughs> forever to get through a property. Uh, but that means just clicking and dragging panos up and down in the list. So you can see I've moved panorama 14 up underneath panorama three. Uh, but if you shoot it in a, a, like a good um, logical sequence, it won't matter anymore. Okay. So if you... Um, want actually here i'll show you this real quick if you look down here you're going to see that um, i have a, a special pictures folder so that's what i mentioned earlier about using the still uh still pictures um if you click um one of these you're going to see it's it's like a partial panorama and you can pull a still image from this um without having to shoot a whole panorama which is quite cool and often this allows you to back up into the corner of a room to get a better perspective okay so Let's talk about the um, some tricks, because that's fun. So a really fun trick that everyone should know, but not everybody knows, is the space bar. So lot, these are all keyboard tricks, really. If you tap the space bar while holding your mouse cursor over any parts of the data, it will just select the nearest panel. So this is really, really handy <laughs> if you're learning data. Because you might, you might get something like this, where you need to just you need to just pick things and kind of pull them apart and move data around. Um, let's, let's try to auto-align this and see what happens. It might work. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay, so auto-alignment just put it together. I didn't have to do anything. So we went from... Let me get it on screen. We went from this to this. That's much better. Couldn't figure out where this room went. I know where it goes. It goes like here, I think. Um, so the space bar. If you tap space bar, it'll just select the nearest panorama. Another cool thing is that if you use the arrow keys on your keyboard, it will move the data around. Because what you'll find is that you use the mouse wheel on your mouse to zoom in and out, but sometimes it doesn't go really where you want. It's supposed to go where you're pointing, but maybe you pointed somewhere and then you think, well, I don't, I don't want to zoom back out. I just want to like look left. You can use the arrow keys on your keyboard um, to do that. You may also want to move all the data at once. So if you hold the shift button, you can drag a box around the data, and then whatever you click and drag will all move. And you'll notice that what moves is what's green. So what's green in terms of data is what has been selected. So you can select, you know, one panorama. You can actually select two panoramas, or you can just select all the panoramas if you want um, and move them wherever you like. There is a trick to this. If you tap, um, I forget what it is, the F key, I think. I'm actually going to show you guys right now how to find out where the shortcut keys are. So even if you don't remember anything I just said, no big deal. If you go to the help button, which is the question mark, and you look at um, the shortcuts tab, it'll tell you all the keyboard shortcuts. So let's see, we've got 
auto rotate cool take snapshots as one didn't know that neat zoom to fit that's really handy actually coverage is good too um and then you've got the shift so i'll show you one more thing with shift actually if i zoom in really far and i hold shift i can select a panel individually by clicking on its center as well oh another cool thing if you zoom in all the centers of the panels are actually compasses so um, when you are shooting, the compass in the camera is capturing data and it's taking readings at every single position and all of those are recorded and averaged later so that um, the compass can be added uh, to the eye by itself. But it's kind of neat, you have access to them. So this can be quite handy if you um, have a panorama, say here, and it's misrotated, you can easily see that its compass differs from the others and that can give you a little heads up on where it's supposed to go. So that's kind of neat. Okay, uh, so there's a few extra things in the help that I didn't mention. Um, there is a um, check for updates in here. There we go. If you click support, you can click check for updates and it will um, look for updates for you. Uh, okay, I'm gonna just answer questions now because we're running out of time. What else have we got here? Uh, do you need to add a memory card to the iGuide camera? Take stills. Nope, they're all saved to the USB drive. Um, the Camera, if you turn on the live, you will always say no card in camera. Just ignore it. No big deal. Tried shooting a pool area common element condominium without having a laser on. I could not align and stitch with only having a green sphere without laser information. How do I align without laser data? Good question. You can't. Never turn the laser off unless you've got a good reason to do so. So um, you wouldn't need to align it if it's a common area uh, most of the time because you don't want to get billed for that common area. So I'll give you an example. You're shooting a condo, it's a unit, you know, it's like really small, it's like 800 square feet or something. You shoot that unit and then there's some amenities. You've got a pool, an exercise room, and a movie room. So none of those things are anywhere near the unit. So if you want, you could create a separate floor. You could call it, you know, um, movie room, and you could go shoot that movie room with the lasers on. What the drafters are gonna do is they're gonna think that you want them to draw that so they're going to they're going to literally draw um, that in, and then they're going to charge you for it. So don't don't bother because that's there's no not a lot of value there. Unless you really want to, go ahead. But uh, my recommendation would be to create a floor. I call it amenities, and then shoot your panels on that floor and turn the lasers off. So then alignment is irrelevant because when it's presented later in the eye guide, there will be little thumbnail images instead of the floor plan, um, which is very effective. You can name each one of them too, which is quite cool. Uh, the only time where you're going to struggle where you don't have data, I'll mention this actually because I didn't bring it up when I said um, when I talked about right-clicking stuff. If you right-click on a floor, you can do something called adding a user panel. So adding a user panel is a way of adding um, a 360 image from any other camera. And when you do that, you have to place it somewhere on on the floor plan. And rotating it can be quite challenging, but there's a trick. So if you look, and I, if you hover your mouse cursor around the data you'll see that there's something called a radar tool, which is just a fancy way of saying there's a green line that follows your cursor. So if you hover your mouse cursor over any of the data, the green line will follow it and it will intersect with that data. And if you look at the image, there will be a corresponding vertical line. It's kind of hard to see here. Let me zoom out and find something better. So I'll hover my mouse cursor over, what can we use here? We use this column here, this column. So I hope you guys can see this. There is now a vertical line on that column um, showing me that that's what I'm pointing at. So when you're aligning data, especially user panels, it's helpful to use this radar tool to um, align your uh, panoramas so that they approximate sort of where they're supposed to go um, rotationally anyway, um, relative to the actual data if you're placing them next to data. My suggestion for condo amenities was to don't worry about the data at all because they won't be presented with a floor plan. They'll just be in a list with uh, preview thumbnails anyway. Okay, cool. Uh, yep, that's good. Okay, that already answered. You're helping me out, Peter. Thank you. Uh, let me see here. Can I selectively discard the laser data so as not so as for it not to get drafted? Yeah, well, so the thing is, you can't delete the data later, but you can, if you put it on its own floor, you can just add notes. You can just put a little note that says, please don't draw this. Just, just, you know, just, I just want the 360s. And the drafters, they're people. They'll say, oh, yeah, no problem. Most of the time what happens is the drafters, um, they know you probably don't want that drawn. So if you shot, say, five or six panoramas 
in different places in a condo building, all amenities, and chuck them on a floor called amenities, but they had laser data, they wouldn't draw them because they think, oh, they just want them in a list. That's fair. So it's, it's pretty, you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, but yeah, just communications with the key here. Just make a note um, and uh, the drafters will know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, if you submit the exported file but realized after there were some panels that were not aligned, does that matter? Ah, kind of. So you want your data to be as well aligned as possible. And the reason is that there's a risk involved in sending in data that's not aligned. So the drafters have never been to that property. They don't know where things go. And there is a chance that um, they won't be able to figure it out. So in most cases, they probably can, depending on how talented they are interpreting the data. Um, but it's not worth the risk. So I'll give you an example why. So don't worry too much about it if you're just starting. If there's a couple rooms that aren't perfect, it's fine, not a big deal. In fact, the data doesn't need to be perfect at all. As long as it looks like a floor plan at about this zoom level that you see on screen right here, that's fine. Um, but let's suppose we had one that was like really out of whack, like way over here and it doesn't make any sense. So they'll probably be able to figure it out. But if they can't, what they're gonna do is they're gonna contact you and say, hey, you need to fix this data, we can't figure it out. So that causes a delay and it snowballs. So you submit the data at 7 p.m. on a Thursday. They don't even see it until, I don't know, 8 a.m. on a Friday. And then they contact you and you don't see their communication until later that afternoon on a Friday. And then you have to go home. Maybe you're out like working. You have to go home and then edit the data on that Friday. And then you submit it and then they don't see it again until the next Saturday. So your client's like freaking out because they're like, where's my tour? Um, so make sure that your data is well aligned that everything is where it's supposed to go. Like don't spend a lot of time on it, but make sure that, you know, when you're looking at the data at about the zoom level, it looks like a floor plan, you should be fine. Um, but also don't be sloppy, you know, don't leave stuff just hanging out in the middle of nowhere because if they can't figure it out, that's that's gonna cost you. <laughs> it's gonna have, you're gonna have angry clients. Um, so you wanna avoid that. Uh, let's see. When do we get charged? Can I export panels from Stitch? Uh, so two questions there. So you, it's monthly billing. Um, so you're going to get sent a bill after each month and it will detail whatever it is that you owe, um, I imagine. And then there's a bunch of payment options. I don't know what they are, but I assume it's bank transfers and credit cards and whatnot. Don't quote me on that. Uh, can I export panos from Stitch? Uh, so no, you have to go through, so you can get all the image data from the iGUIDE after it's processed in one download. It's like a button that you click and it's called Photospheres and it appears in the report. And when you click it, you, can, you just download the whole thing if you want. You can also, technically speaking, download each individual one, one at a time if you really wanted to. Most people don't bother. It's much faster just to download them all uh, in one go. Do you have to scan inside of the closets? Uh, what if it's full of stuff? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, let me check how much time we have. Okay, this will be the last one, and then we'll be done. So closets are funny. Everyone always asks this constantly. Um, so I really need to write like a whole article on closets probably. <laughs> probably helpful at this point. So. Um, I'll preface this by saying, when in doubt, always shoot a panorama. You know what I mean? Like, if there's ever a time where you're not sure about something and you think, I don't know what to do here, just shoot a panorama. It fixes almost every problem you could possibly have. So closets are funny because um, there are big closets. There are little closets. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Steve, did I skip your question? Okay, I'll go back and I'll, I'll find it. Um, so the uh, closets almost always require that you shoot a panorama uh, for them because the um, the data in the closets is important. This camera is you know designed to measure a property, so that includes ugly spaces like storage rooms and closets. But some closets are more important than others. So a walk-in closet, yeah, you definitely have to shoot a panorama even if it's full of stuff. So um, but it's like basically it's a room, you know. Little closets are, are really important if they're on the perimeter of a property, not so important if they're on the interior, uh, but often closets will will you know have one back to back with another, so the drafters don't really know where that interior wall is unless you kind of you know shoot a panorama in there. But if a closet is full of stuff, place the camera just in front of the closet and shoot it anyway. So often there'll be enough you know data there for the drafters to figure it out. If you're really uncertain, you think to yourself, well, there's no way they're getting any information out of this. It's very rare, it happens like one in a thousand houses. You might have to ask the homeowner or the agent or whoever's around to move some stuff. That's like the worst case scenario. It's only ever happened to me like a couple times. Um, it's not um, a big deal um, in the sense that, um, you know, you, you it's gonna happen too often, but it may, it may happen. And you might just have to, you know, have that conversation with someone when you're on site. 
hey, I, I need to measure the space. You, you got to move a couple things out of here. And you don't have to clean out the whole closet. You just need to move out enough stuff that the laser can hit something that's like a wall, you know. Okay, Steve, a question. You had two. What was the first one? Not stitch related. Commercial shoot on Saturday. Medical practice. Only in one suite of a building. All they care about is their suite and integration of Google Street View. Is it possible to do an eye guide without a floor plan? Oh, yeah, okay. So technically speaking, um, no, it is impossible to do an eye guide without a floor plan. But you can do an incomplete floor plan uh, if you're going to export it to Google Street View. So what that means is that you take your, um, and the reason is that the floor plan is actually integral to the exporting to Google. You have to have it or it won't work because um, it positionally locates the panoramas. So what you want to do for Google Street View, my recommendation is that I'll give you a little heads up, but go read the KBA on that on the support desk because it'll detail everything you need to do. But in terms of what you're creating, you're only capturing what's required. You don't need to go into every single room and every single space. You just need to get what you need. And then um, when you bring it into Stitch, you just treat it exactly like you would a normal project, except that there's going to be a bunch of stuff missing, and that's okay. The only catch here is that it needs to be continuous. It absolutely must be. So here's an example. You're going to shoot a bank, and you've got a lobby, and you've got three meeting rooms in the back. So you can shoot the lobby and go shoot the meeting rooms, but you need to shoot whatever, whatever connects them as well. So the hallway, for example, going all the way to the back and connecting those meeting rooms needs to be shot. So often it's not a case of square footage exactly, because that's usually not very much. It's a case of like what needs to be included on Street View, and how do you get from one place to another? And Google's really big on that. They're all about visual navigation. So another tip is to shoot more panoramas than you really need. Shoot lots. There's no limit, so you might as well. Um, and make sure that when you're shooting, you can connect you know, one area to another, or the drafts people won't be able to connect them. So when you ex or won't be able to create a, a floor plan for you to export. So when you export to Google Street View, you, in the export, you're actually overlaying the floor plan, or you know, most of the floor plan, whatever is there, you've captured onto onto Google Maps. Like you're actually just putting it like right on where it goes, so that all of the panoramas are not only connected, but they're actually in their correct relative locations or approximate relative locations on Google Maps, because Google Maps has a similar style of interface to the eye guide. It has a map top-down map view with little dots that you can click on. So if you mess it up, they'll be in the wrong spots. So I hope that mostly answered your question. Um, let's see what we've got here. So is there another one? Uh, suggestion for anyone worried about making a permanent mistake, I always make two copies from USB just in case. Yes, but best practice is to copy the data from your USB drive onto your computer. That way you've always got it, always got it on the drive. And um, when you're working on your computer, if it like I don't know, explodes or something, no big deal, you've still got that data there. Uh, okay, I already addressed that one. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Steve. I totally skipped your questions initially. I apologize. <laughs> so I did still photos. Agent banner shows in the eye guy disappeared. Can I figure out how to restore it? Uh, you can always add banners. Um, yeah, I'm going to do another um, uh, eye guide portal webinar shortly. Um, there's a lot of new people just getting their cameras, and the three sort of core webinars that will happen weekly like i did two this week i'll probably do two next week um and they're popular people show up they like them so whatever uh are stitch uh shooting with the camera and then using the eye guide portal so yeah they'll be that will be basically the next one it's not literally the next one i think it'll happen either week after not sure i'll check into that um so i answered that one i did that one as well got it perfect all right let's go to the bottom Uh, if you submit the export, oh, I already answered that one. Um, okay, cool. So that's all the questions. Okay, so we've run out of time. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it. I love it when people actually show up. It's great. <laughs> if you have any questions about anything, please go to the iGUIDE support desk um, and look for knowledge base articles and um, create support tickets. That is the best way uh, to get the answers that you need. Um, have a great day. Have a great weekend as well. Cheers.